Hi guys, you know, remember back in another video we looked at these EF Johnson transmitters. And we have the Johnson Viking Ranger here on the bench. And it's time to start doing some disassembling. And what we want to do is remove this front face off of it. Now, if you're not sure how to uh, keep up with what knobs go where, it's always best to grab your camera, take you some pictures. Um, you have to be removing this meter, so you need to come back here and take pictures of how the wires run to it, so you can uh, put it back together the way it's supposed to be. And one good thing about you know we've got this vinyl or rubber ring around the back of it, and it looks pretty good. One little gap here, a little crack there, and just a little crack over here, but it looks real good. We'll probably put some uh, rubber rejuvenator back on it soften it up a bit so it'll stay because I like to try to keep as much of the original transmitter here you know instead of replacing with uh, modern day stuff you know or reproduction stuff I like to keep as original as possible so I'm going to go ahead and uh, start taking all the knobs off got a box here that I can put them all in so we'll go ahead and start doing that. Now that all the knobs are off of, I went ahead and took a nut driver and loosened up all the uh, nuts on the controls. So we can go ahead and get all them off. Now here you see there's a knob here and it's uh, more crystals underneath of it you don't have to take that off yet that is just a plug it looks like a knob that turns um, and what it is you pull it out you can actually plug crystals into it now I'm no expert at all on these uh, old Johnsons I've only worked on a few in my life but I have been around them I've seen them operate, so I'm going to be uh, doing a lot of consulting and looking for information and searching the web for tricks and stuff and one of the best people I know that works on these is Terry over at D-Lab Electronics. He uh, works on a lot of Johnsons. Yeah, that's pretty much loose now we're going to, have to go to the back side and uh, remove some stuff back there and this should come off before the faceplate comes off so there should be a couple of nuts in the back that's going to be holding this on so you've got a couple of lamps here that you have to uh, remove And we don't want to damage the cool windings that just go in these holes up here. But here we have some more lamps. There's one on each side here. And you can see it. And this one here is uh, the bracket is broken. So we'll have to uh, fabricate a new one. I go on here and it's just held on by a rivet. It's a real thin piece of aluminum. And it should come up and have a hole here so it fits over that little, uh, it's part of the uh, lamp holder that comes through and the little jewel on the front and this broke off so we'll have to replace that. Just make a new one. We can make it look just like the original and no one will ever tell it. Right, we got the, uh, dial glass out and uh, I'm not sure if this was regular glass or plastic it is plastic so you know when you go to clean this you got to be very careful because we do not want to remove any of this uh, printing on here so a lot of time will have to be spent to get this polished out and cleaned back up 
Now everything else is loose. Everything's disconnected all but the meter and the dial pointer. So we'll have to go ahead and get that loose. If we rotate this all the way around, we should be able to get a screwdriver right here on it. Yep, and she's on there pretty good. Alright, so we got it off and it took a little bit of work. Had to put a little penetrating oil in here and uh, put a couple of pliers on it and just wiggle it until it finally broke free. So we have to get all this cleaned back up. We'll set that in the box. Now the only thing we got left is this big nut. The VFO, so I'll go ahead and get that loose. Well, as you can see, the uh, front panel is off, and uh, something that I am concerned about is this. Uh, now, when I pull the front panel off, I already noticed this is just completely loose. So it looks like something in there is already broken. Well as you can see we have the uh, VFO compartment opened up. And that was a bit of work. I'm going to tell you, if anybody ever tells you there's nothing to it, getting the front panel off and getting to this VFO, that is a job. And as I was afraid, you can see that this is the uh, knob that hooks to the end of the uh, VFO coupler and it couples to the uh, air available capacitor for the VFO and you can see that uh, brownish looking stuff right there it's broke and this is supposed to sit in here like this and it's like a, like a sheet of mica and it is just it's gone um, you know the good thing is I know I didn't break it but as you can see it is it's already gone and if you look in the bottom of the VFO compartment you see all that stuff that's what's left of it it has completely deteriorated then we have a regulator tube here and looking at it, it definitely doesn't look too healthy. As you can see around here on the bottom, you see where the tube is burnt. And I think this is the OA2. That's a General Electric, but I can't read. I, don't know if it's a, I can't remember if it's the OA or an OB2 regulator to and I just saw this too T6AU6 you see the top of it it's completely gone uh, white on the inside so we know that's pretty much gone too So those two tubes will have to be replaced and I'm pretty sure there's going to be some uh, resistors down here that has gone nuclear. I'm just going to have to get down there and find them. I have the front panel tore down meter took out of it so I can go ahead and Start the uh, cleaning process on this and see if we get it back going and go through the meter, get it good and cleaned up. Um, I can always tell you this, and you know, it's not expect. you know, it's <laughs> it would be strange if it wouldn't, but you know, the VFO has been into not one but it's like several times and uh. 
the one way that you can tell is that the uh, what Terry likes to call the uh, Chernobyl resistor here has been replaced and this looks like a about a seven or eight watt resistor has been installed here now the resistor is probably good it's no problem but you know it's a lot of work to get down into the VFO so it's best just to go ahead and rebuild everything you know while we at it we know that the uh, regulator tube up here on top has to be replaced and also the uh, VFO tube but there's one good thing that I like that I, I don't see here on this one is the phenolic material is not burnt um, a lot of times when you take these apart you'll see it's right around the uh, tube here the material is burnt up and cracked all up and uh, just about gone but I don't see that problem with this one and you know we also need to check solder connections up here since we're in here because we don't want to put it back together and then find that we got to go back in here because we missed something so this is one area that we will inspect real good there's a uh, wafer switch down here in the bottom that we'll need to get good and cleaned and uh, check all these variable caps make sure they're good it's not a whole lot down here there is a couple of other resistors under the tubes that we'll just check out and make sure they are in tolerance and then we'll get the uh, this whole area in here in the front get all the tubes out get it all cleaned up get the relay out and uh, change the cap on the relay get these uh, this relay cleaned it's got a little rust on it but it doesn't look too bad get the contacts uh, clean never grind on this uh, you know I hear a lot of people talking about using a burnishing tool on relays well that was probably okay back in the day when you could buy a set of relays you know but the best way to do it is uh, use a piece of card stock hundred dollar bill works perfect but uh, I like to use business card stock soaked in uh, cleaner and run under there and clean them also pencil eraser does a wonderful job on relay contacts so yeah we got quite a bit to go on this right here and get this part of it this front section all done and cleaned up and then uh, we can start reassembling the VFO. So I was showing you all this dust that was up here. And I was thinking it was a mica. But it's not. It's actually a very thin piece of uh, phenolic material. You can see that little bit is left on it. Uh, what's on there is practically see-through. It's so thin. I mean it's probably. A, I don't know half a millimeter a little thicker than a sixteenth and what it does this is the uh, coupling that goes on to the uh, variable capacitor and then this end goes on to the uh, frontier drive and this piece is normally a square piece it's real thin and it kinda puts it together like this right here and makes a coupling well as you can see that is completely gone there's nothing left on it so what we'll have to do is uh, drill out these little small rivets on uh, both pieces cut us a new piece of phenolic or uh, I don't know I might look around see if I can find something that's going to uh, have the flexibility but be more durable and uh, it's just a little square piece you know you can make it round it it doesn't really matter as long as it gets that uh, you know action back in it well it is in case this shaft on this does not 
line up correctly you know this would give a little bit and uh, you know there's several other things we could probably uh, make we could probably get a, uh, a spring couple and put in there but again you know I want to try to keep things as original as possible so you know once this thing is up and running one of these days I won't be here and it'll probably be passed on to someone else and you know I like stuff that when other people go into it they can say hey whoever worked on this took pride in what he was doing you know and that's one of my things you know I work in the quality in the uh, industry field and you know I like to uh, put quality in a lot of stuff that I do and another way I can tell that this has been into if you look here you can see some marks on these threads and that's where someone has put you know some pliers on here to screw this nut off to take this bunny up now this thing is super stiff it didn't feel that bad when the knob was on it but it is it is it's super super um, stiff so we're going to have to get this uh, broken apart and uh, get all that old dried grease out of it and clean it up and go back in there with some good assembly paste and that stuff will last forever in there but you know there's, there's nothing wrong with uh, putting something around here and clamping it you know it does get the threads just a little bit I've got some tooling out in the uh, garage that I use and I'm going to get out there and look for it and what it is is like a spanner and it's got two pins in it and I probably got one that will fit across here and all I'll need to do is come in here and drill two, a hole on each side straight through this uh, this nut here and then you can slide that spanner over and those two pins will go into those holes and then uh, screw the back off of it you know you can uh, set this in uh, a part of hot boiling water and loosen up that uh, that glue because somebody's filled it back up with glue I scraped some of it off just to see how hard it was and I'm not sure what they use it's not paint they use some type of varnish or something and they look like they cut it on all in the threads pretty heavy so it might be harder to get off but you can set this in some hot boiling water and let it sit there and boil and um, get everything out pick it out with some tongs and probably get it to screw off but we'll look at how we're going to do it uh, it would be nice to get the two holes in there and that way you can slide it on there and the pins will go down because we don't want to damage the threads no more than what they already damaged and since it's already been uh, player marks on it you can see where they gripped it we just might do that to keep from damaging any further you know after closer inspection on this right here I was thinking you know I hadn't mentioned it it might have been mica but after getting in here and looking at it you can see the darker material is the original phenolic piece that was in there but this here you can see it's real flexible and it's you know clear on the edges you can see right there it's clear on the edges it's real flexible so that's some type of glue that somebody's put on it so yeah someone's had this problem before and uh, they tried gluing it in place and that's what all that uh, crap is underneath the floor right here is that glue that has uh, disintegrated and turned to a powder substance so that's all that is uh, yeah that kind of 
throwing me for a loop there for a minute trying to figure out what the stuff was made out of. But yeah, it was definitely phenolic board that was on it. That's no problem to fix though. Well, I got lucky taking this apart. All I did was uh, wrap a piece of scotch bright around here and uh, grabbed it with my pliers and was able to take the uh, nut and loosen it up by hand. Now, when you take this apart, be very careful because there are some uh, ball bearings in here. So when you do that, you know, you don't want them things running everywhere because this old grease is dry and I'm pretty sure they're um, very loose. You've got a couple of uh, spacers in here also. Make sure that you get the uh, when you're putting these back together there's a bevel in this spacer and they go towards the balls um, don't put the other side or you're going to have problems getting your uh, vernier to turn so make sure you uh, keep up with way those uh, spacers came off and you see there's also one on the back side of this and you can see our little ball bearings in there yep. I'm going to have to get this soaked out and get this grease off so I can get these ball bearings out And now it's time now to go ahead and put this vernier back together. I've got it all cleaned up as you can see. Nice and shiny. Shouldn't be no problems whatsoever. And uh, I'm going to use this uh, Dowling coin um, assembly paste. And the reason why I like to use this stuff is that it doesn't take a whole lot and it never ever dries out, at least that I have ever seen. Clean the excess off here. Put a little bit where each ball bearing is, and uh, it'll lubricate where the ball bearing rides at. Plus, it'll hold our ball bearings in place while we're putting this thing back together. And again, it does not take a whole lot of it. It's good and free now. So you can see the chassis is really dirty. But, um, I mean, it's not as bad as you think it is. You can take a lot of this right here and just, uh, brush it out. Then use a little compressor and clean it. 
and then after you get all the grit dirt off of it and out of the place you can go back and uh, shine up this aluminum if you need to clean it up real good a toothbrush works real good with a little cleaner on it also but yeah I think this uh, chassis is going to clean up nicely <clears throat> now what I got to do next is go ahead and get all the tubes out I'm going to go ahead and remove this control shaft that's here and what we do is take the coupling loose back here in the back and then pull the uh, bracket loose from it's just a nut and a bolt same thing with this control we'll take it loose swing it out clean it clean all the contacts on it clean everything in here clean up the transformer here over there on this side and that's the control we'll need to remove we'll do the same thing with this one there's a little variable cap right back here at the back there you can see it better this way and we'll just take all this loose and clean all that and we need to lube all this here after we uh, clean it so it'll turn easier and get that shaft clean and get this uh, nut up here at the front cleaned and lubed same thing with this wafer switch get it taken loose and pull it off and you know check all the wire connections make sure they look good make sure all the uh, tabs on the uh, wafer switch is making contact and get them clean and get all that lubed up we also need to uh, pull that relay and work on it, get it cleaned out. Now I noticed that when I turn this rig on, this relay is automatic engaging. Um, regardless of what mode you got it in, tune. Um, CW or AM it automatically engages. It should not engage from the way I understand until you uh, key the transmitter. So we'll have to look at that and find out what's going on, what's causing it to uh, engage. You know there is a electrolytic capacitor down here across the corner that could be uh, causing an issue here also. So we'll need to look at that and see if we can find out what's going on. And once we get this front deck all straightened out and you know all the bad components replaced and uh, you know under the core here there's some you know, molded mica caps you can see them sticking out right here you know they shouldn't be a problem um, in a non high voltage situation they don't use to go bad they do however develop silver mica disease but you know maybe there won't be a problem there I'll get them tested and just see how they look well guys if you can see uh, all the tubes out I have these two control rods out the final in the buffer shaft and uh, the brackets to hold it in and you know, probably one of the most time-consuming parts of doing any kind of restoration is cleaning. And you can see this side over here. It's nice, pretty, and clean. Even the transformer's good and clean. This bracket was removed, and everything, all the gunk that was up underneath here has been cleaned off even under the VFO from about here back over has been cleaned now this side is still dirty as can be as you can see back there and the way you do that you know you just take everything up get it out of the way there's several things that I use when I'm cleaning 
stuff. One of them is a paintbrush, you know, to get in there and just brush out any of the loose stuff that's in the way. Then I use a toothbrush that's had the bristles cut down to about a quarter of an inch or so. And all I do is take a toothbrush, spray a little bit of this foam on it, and get in here and just clean everywhere I can get to. You know, if the component can come up like this relay, I'll take it loose, lay it aside. Just control here, I'll take it loose, lay it aside. Then I'll come back with some paper towels and get in there and just scrub it all back out. And you know it comes up nice and pretty and clean. There's no problem at all. Now I could go in and polish this chassis. I'm just leaving it original like it is. Like I say, you know, it's just very time consuming. Some components you can lift them up. Be very careful, you know. And this way you can get underneath of them. And clean out that crud that's filled up. And go back with your paper towel and go back over it. Now if you get to a, uh, a hard stubborn spot and you can't get nothing off of it, you know, you got the brass brushes that you can use. Like back here in the back is a couple of screw heads like this one. That has some green corrosion on it, you know. And I just take the small part of the brush and just sit down and work it until it's nice, pretty, and shiny again, and then go back and clean it with the cleaner. Now to get this side done, I'm gonna have to go ahead and uh, flip the radio over, take this relay loose, and lay it aside, take this nut off. I can clean all this here and uh, take this bracket out and lay this aside. If I can get all cleaned up, I need but and go ahead and get this uh, wafer switch cleaned up and uh, back here in the back we got a uh, tuning capacitor Let's see, I think y'all can see it from there there it is, that's the relay we got to remove and got an electrolytic underneath of it that has to be uh, replaced, that's a 5 microfarad at 250 volts and then we got our air variable capacitor back here. All that's got to be cleaned up and relube for to get, you know, turned smoothly. But you know, it's just that's one of the time consuming things that it takes. And you know, you just pick a section, you move the stuff out of it. I went ahead and poured all the tubes out anyway because all the tubes has got to be checked and cleaned and so forth, you know, but with as much stuff out of the way that you can get out of the way, it's a lot easier to uh, get in here and clean this old stuff and get it looking nice and shiny, but as you can see, she is coming along and it's probably best now to go ahead and clean it before I repair it, because it's, it's going to be repaired regardless, you know but uh, this way when you're working on it, you're, you're working on it clean It's like this control shaft here that goes for the final to tune the uh, tank circuit. I'll take a drill, chuck this up on the drill, take a uh, kitchen scotch bright. these are the cheap ones from the dollar store, they're not that very aggressive, put it in there, turn the drill on and just rub it up and down and get it nice back shiny. This way you know you don't take the finish off but you clean it back up like it's supposed to be. So the only part of the uh, front of the radio it wasn't cleaned up was right here under this uh, buffer capacitor. The uh, tuning cap for the buffer stage 
and it's kind of dirty and doesn't spin you know or turn as good as it needs so I'm gonna soak this in some uh, vinegar salt solution get it clean re-lubricate it and get the chassis down here underneath of it clean but this is the only part of the chassis that hasn't been cleaned yet and you can see now something that I have not been able to figure out on these radios <coughs> is how to tell if it was a factory wired radio or a kit radio one thing I did notice I had this relay out earlier and checked it I still have it replaced the capacitor on it but I got to order the capacitors this weekend and get them in but directly under it you see where it looks dirty but that's not dirt that is a EF Johnson label so I don't know if that has anything to do with it being uh, factory wired or kit form I have no idea um, if somebody comes let me know comment down below I appreciate it you can see I have a tuning cap in the uh, vinegar salt solution and if you haven't seen this process if you'll go back to I think it was video number 40 shows how to uh, mix up the vinegar salt solution and it will pretty much take all the contaminants corrosion and everything off different uh, electronic parts especially these old style wafer switches and it just gets in there and just lifts it all off and you do have to neutralize it after you take it out so you don't you know start another type of corrosion but you can already see uh, this shaft right here see how nice and shiny it's already starting to turn it doesn't uh, take long at all and hopefully when this comes out all this right here will be the uh, correct color and the plates will be nice and shiny Well, it's been in there about 20 minutes and I'm going to go ahead and take it out and neutralize it and clean it. Now you just neutralize it with uh, distilled water with baking soda in it. And also video uh, number 40 shows you how to mix the distilled water baking soda ratio so it comes out right. But uh, yeah, she looks good and clean to me. See the metal is... Uh, nice and shiny the ceramics are good and clean hardly anything left on them and the reason why I like doing this because it takes no scrubbing at all and you know you don't have to get in there and wear a brush nothing or, or polish anything because it will just clean it right up you can see this molded mica cap on the back is good and clean just like the day it was bought. Well everything in the front is all cleaned up, relays clean, capacitors clean, chassis all clean. Now as soon as the parts get in I'll get in here and replace this electrolytic capacitor here. We'll get the uh, Chernobyl resistor out of here and even though this is a 7 watt I don't know how long it's been in here I don't know the health of it I'm going to go ahead and put a brand new resistor in here and clean up some of these solder joints and make sure everything under here looks good uh, we'll go through some of the solder joints also in the VFO there's a couple of other resistors down here will get checked out but uh, for the most part, you know, all the controls are clean. I do have to replace the drive potentiometer. It is, uh, it's bad. And, see, it's locked up. The problem with this is that there's, you know, there's higher voltage going to it. And it's an old wear around resistor. So, you know, you know we got to get this replaced. Uh, I'm going to pull it out. Take a look at it. There ain't no way to repair it because it's it's wear around and I know it's bad. But as I say it's got high voltage on it and 
if this thing goes bad it could actually short the high voltage to the case and uh, that won't be pretty and that's one re another reason why if you see something like this on an old rig like this don't plug it in the wall because chances are this is going to cause some issues it's going to blow fuses if it had fuses in it this unit has no fuses in it someone did put fuses in the uh, line cord for the AC mains which will do away with this put a good free wire coil in it and we'll also put a fuse in the back of it and that's a must and need to have a fuse in it because uh, you know these transformers back here these are precious and pretty much if you burn up a transformer there's not a whole lot you can do not unless you can find one but chances are you'll find a whole unit with a transformer in it not unless you're handy at rewiring these um, I have rewired a few it's not a fun job it takes a lot of time so we don't you know <laughs> you want to avoid having to do that So I'm just about finished with the top side, just got to wait on some parts to come in. I got to pick up some more black paint if I can uh, take care of the rust around the uh, transformer core and get that uh, back situated. But I want to go ahead and start on the bottom side and trying to uh, clean it up and address a few issues here. One of the issues that we did notice in the uh, first video I did on this is that when you turn the band switch, this mechanism here that turns the switch up in the VFO will get locked up and uh, you're not able to turn it. Well, the reason is, is these two capacitors here. Someone has installed these. Um, from what I can see, these are not original. And I can see the fresh solder joints so these are the wrong side and they're so big that they won't you cannot move them from where they are they will not go down any further so i'm gonna have to get these two replaced and get it off this uh block so this will uh, operate like it should i also got to get this uh drive control out of here and find a replacement for it because i already know it is toast and to get it out you got this big resistor here that's in the way so that's got to be removed and then I can take this part loose swing it down desolder it and see if I can find a new one so I'll be looking for another one before I even take this out and then you know just to your basic cleaning and get all the wafer switches and in, in the bottom cleaned up um, lube the uh, well capacitors down here and make sure they work. This one did turns fine, but you know, you still need to get it clean and lubed up. Now, early in this video, I said I didn't know how to tell if it was a uh, factory wired unit or a kit. Well, after doing a little research. Um, and then most of the time that's all you got to do is a little research you can pretty much find your answer Google is great for that the way I understand it is all of your factory built units your sockets will be riveted in all your kit built units your sockets are bolted in so if that's the correct um, way of identifying it and this was a kit and uh, you know it looks like it was uh, built pretty nicely anyway I just wanted to share that with you uh, maybe some of the old guys can you know drop by and verify this just to make sure that I am correct on it alright sorry about the handheld video but you know, up top side everything is looking pretty good everything's all clean still got a little bit of rust on those uh, transformer nuts I'm going to pull them out and give them a good cleaning I 
I um, was thinking about uh, pulling out this tank circuit and just soaking the whole thing and get everything uh, shiny and bright. I haven't made my mind up if I wanted to do that yet or not. Um, but everything is clean, you know, it's just got some tarnish on this coil, which isn't going to hurt anything. I've got down there with some cleaner and uh, cleaned out that um, bubble capacitor. Blowed it out real good and she looks nice and clean, no problems whatsoever. And again, all I use to, uh, to clean this is just... Uh, Some uh, different uh, toothbrushes. Some of them will cut off short. You know, a lot of these are recently replaced because you did wear them out. And I have a old uh, test pro clip with a hole drilled in the oversized in it. And I just cut off the Q tips and stick them in there and uh, dip them in the cleaning solution and you know uh, get down here in these hard to get two places and just uh, you know clean away and then ease a paper towel underneath of it to dry it all out and get the residue off works pretty good but yeah she's looking a lot better than she did on the top side so the last thing on the top side to do is replace that uh, 8 microfarad cap on the uh, relay and uh, go ahead and replace the, as Terry calls it the Chernobyl resistor and get that uh, a new one in there and then I can work on this underneath side got to get all these caps replaced I'll get two capacitors I'm gonna put a couple of uh, terminal strips mounted to these studs and Put two caps in series up there and go ahead and run the ground I don't like having the ground on the end of these shafts I want the ground on the chassis so we'll be running a jump aware on this too because you know any connection like this you get a problem with corrosion building up and losing the ground especially on the uh, main filter caps and I took these loose and just looked at them and someone has put in a set of 82 microfarad at 450 volts and they have them in series and just just had them flapping around in there I don't like that at all so we'll get them mounted up here on some terminal strips and we'll go ahead and get the rest of these uh, electrolytes changed out just as soon as I get some and there's a, a couple of dual caps down here actually two positives one ground so we'll get them out and get some new ones mounted in now as I look in here I see somebody has done been in and replaced some of the uh, older paper caps that was in here you can see these yellow caps here um, from what I can see they are not stock those have been replaced So we're looking here at the schematic and uh, I'm going to go ahead and replace the capacitors that's inside this transmitter. And we can see here that we have a 5R4 rectifier tube and a 6AX5 low voltage rectifier. The 5R4 is your uh, high voltage. The 6AX5 is your low voltage. And coming off the 5R4, we have a 10 microfarad capacitor. That is our main filter capacitor. And the one that's in the radio is uh, 10 microfarad at 700 volts. Well, you're probably not going to find that. So, what would you do? Well, what I'm going to do is put two capacitors in series here. And I'm going to use two 20 microfarad at 450 volts. That will give me 10 microfarads at 900 volts. Now I heard some people say they replace, you know, with a higher microfarad. I wouldn't suggest doing that. Because, you know, you, you end up loading the circuit down more. 
and well, you know you got to be honest this isn't new equipment it's old equipment transformers are harder and harder to find not that you can get someone to specially build you one so I would try to stick somewhere within the same value you know 10 to 15 microfarads is will be plenty uh, we will go ahead on the low voltage and replace that with a uh, 30 microfarad at 450 volt mouse I read some mods online that I was looking at and they're talking about solid state in this unit and what you would do is just go in pull the tubes out and put rectifiers you know solid state rectifiers diodes under the tube sockets I don't suggest doing that either and the reason being is that you solid state it it's going to produce more voltage than what the uh, the two rectifier counterparts are going to do also right now the radius unit is built when you flip the power switch and it comes on these tubes come up slowly so it's not that you turn it on at 600 volts instantly you know the filament has to warm up and then the tube starts going into operation at the you know 30 40 seconds so it's not instant when you change this over to diode or solid stated as soon as you flip the power switch boom that's there's your high voltage or there's your low voltage so I would not do that um, you know it makes it a whole lot harder on the whole circuit you know your your voltage just rushes right in with the original tubes it comes up slowly and hey this is a tube radio it's 50 years old or better and you know the sound of this Ranger radio is already superb you know it's great so you don't want to go messing up the sound not being an audio fool or anything you know it's just that there's some things you just want to let be. Well, while we're under the bottom, I want to go ahead and uh, address this abomination and find out just what is going on here. As we know that these capacitors are interfering with the uh, cam there that changes for the VFO. So if we look here at all chassis layout we can see uh, C55 it's kind of hard to read but I blowed it up and look at it and we can see here that C55 is supposed to be one capacitor and what this was was a paper cap it's uh, and this capacitor is a 0.1 microfarad at 400 volts well it looks like they went in and put two capacitors in there of the old uh, dip capacitors and they're right good size now why they done that I guess they just didn't have the correct replacement so they uh, cobbled in two big capacitors so this is uh, the first of the uh, mistakes that we got to uh, get rid of Taking a peek at the schematic, we can see that um, C55, which is a point one, is in the second audio amplifier. Now, either, like I said, they didn't have the correct replacements, or they're trying to change something in the audio stage. So, uh, and you see this is coming off the plate of uh, the 12AX7 um, V7B. And we have this big 470k resistor here, which we'll need to check anything in the K range is a suspect to uh, being out of tolerance. There's a 47k here, so you know all these high value resistors in this radio is going to have to be uh, checked because you know, the old carbon comp resistors are 
notorious for going out of spec but we need to get the correct capacitor back in here and uh, that'll stop the interference of our cam mechanism so I have one side of the caps loose and uh, we can see that these are 0.22 at 600 volts well that will pretty much uh, narrow down close enough to what's supposed to be in there as far as uh, the capacitance but you know you put two in series that's 1200 volts of capacitance and the circuit only you know requires 400 working volts DC so we have a uh, 0.1 here that will go back in it and this is a uh, tubular style capacitor and uh, we have the ground in figured out but you can see that when they did this come on focus you can see right here that they just cut the old lead off and left it on there and uh, soldered directly to the terminal it's all messy and everything and then the other lead is uh, sticking up right here with this great big huge blob of solder on it so we got to get all that cleaned up and plus we got to check all these resistors in here also like I said those high value resistors will uh, eventually go out of tolerance so let me go ahead and get this in here cleaned up and uh, with that cap out of the way our band switch should pretty much work no problems whatsoever it's going to need a little uh, grease on the mechanism you know it's got some old hard grease on it but uh, yeah this should be uh, fine now Okay, so I got the resistors poured out of circuit so we can look at them. You can see there's two resistors right here. There's a 47K and a 220K. And we want to go ahead and check those and just see where they're at. And I can already tell you they're probably going to be all over the shop. Uh, oh, 220K check 323. And our 47k checks 54.9 which isn't too bad on that one but you know we'll go ahead and replace it while we're in there but the uh, as you can see the 220k is just uh, way out it's gained another hundred so now we got this uh, big uh, cobbled in capacitor out of the way we got the uh, proper capacitor back down in here As you see that's plenty of room in here for the cam mechanism to work got the uh, 220k and the 47k ohm resistor replaced we got a lot more down here that's got to be checked and go through all those and get them out of the way um, also got to uh, add an order for these capacitors here to get mounted back up here by the uh, choke but the next thing I want to do is go ahead and uh, pull R13 out which is your drive control part that's a 25k 4 watt part and it has an issue and I don't know if I can repair the part which I have in the past or just what I'm going to have to do to it but to get this out I got to take uh, this big bias resistor out and these couple little resistors in there put in with a couple of uh, bolts here and stand also got to get all that loose so can I get that uh, part out of there you know I got the part out I had to take the crystal VFO switch loose and push it back a little bit because the uh, 
leads on the uh, part was right behind the bake light. We didn't want to crack that uh, bake light on that switch. I don't know how hard it would be to find a replacement for it. But now we should be able to take this uh, cover off the back and see what we can find. Now to do that on the backing there's a couple of tangs that are pushed out into the uh, a hole in the side. And I'll see if I can focus on that so you can see it right there. And there should be one on the other side too. So we should be able to take a pick and put it in here and just lift that right up. Okay, and then we'll get the other side. And now I'll pop this off. Well, I got the uh, potentiometer apart, and as you can see, it was not happy inside. The thing has gone through uh, total meltdown. Now, as you can see, uh, the way this part is designed, around the outside is a, uh, a strip with wire wrapped around This is a wire around resistor. And this is all center wiper. I can reach in here and pull this up and go ahead and pull this out of the way. And you can see the damage. And that's where our short to uh, ground was at. The whole uh, section here is burnt out. So when the uh, center wiper comes around, it falls into that valley, and the switch doesn't want to turn anymore, and it also shorts the ground. So I got to find one of these 25k way around pots. Maybe it won't be too hard to come by. Well, looky here, what we have. Um, I know it's not been several days past. <laughs> I was uh, sitting here thinking and I remembered the uh, old spare Heathkit Apache TX1 that I had so I pulled the schematic looked through the parts list and sure enough 25k resistor or potentiometer so now we don't have to leave uh, our Ranger sitting here with all the stuff hanging out of it I can go ahead and check this and uh, make sure it's okay clean it up a bit and uh, go ahead and install it and I'll just set this one over there with the uh, old heat kit so I know what came out of it so sometimes we do get lucky but it's the exact same part not much difference in it so we'll be good to go Well, let's go ahead and uh, check out this part and make sure it's okay. About 45 ohms. To 25k. I think she's good to go. I'm talking about luck, I didn't even think about the old uh, Apache over there having that potentiometer in it. Now you know I could have pulled one out of the uh, Viking 2 and put it in here until I uh, went to uh, restore that one but luckily uh, the old Apache saved the day. Well if you can see we got the uh, new drive control in and I moved on over here to the transformer 
and took these uh, studs out because they are not needed and I went ahead and pulled out this uh, filter cap arrangement that they had 82 microfarads at 450 volts that would give it about 40 41 microfarads which is uh, a little bit too much and may put a drain on the power supply um, the uh, schematic calls for a 10 microfarad at 700 volts so I got two 20 microfarads at 450 volts in series that should give me 10 mics at uh, about 900 volts so we should be good to go and I went ahead and run the ground all the way to the chassis instead of up on the stud that was here now I got to uh, go ahead and check these resistors on the schematic you see I got two right here that's in series I need to find out what originally supposed to be there so I can get rid of that and then uh, we'll have to replace the uh, 30 mic cap and there's two double caps up here that'll have to be replaced and I'll look and see if I got replacements for them so I really got to get down here and study the schematic now to figure out what someone is doing you know we have all big resistor right here that has the adjustable clip on it but someone has added this resistor which is going to ground they're just using this end of resistor and it's going up here to a terminal strip then it's got these two big resistors now what they're trying to do I have no idea I have looked at pictures online and I do not see any resistors or any big power resistors in this area and looking at the schematic I don't see anything either so I got to get down here and trace out all this and find out what's going on and see can't we uh, I don't know if someone's did some kind of mod trying to get more drive out of the radio or something but it looks like a uh, 20,000 ohm resistor these say 8700 on each one of them so no idea what all that is about but we got to get those figured out okay so we continue going and replace the electrolytics while we add it got this old big giant um, 30 microfarad at 450 out and just replaced it with a 40 microfarad at 450 now up here we have two dual caps and these are 10 mics at it, um, each at 50 volts so we're going to get these out cut the leads off and what we'll do is replace them with these yep these little bitty caps We're going to replace these giant caps and they'll be mounted right down here on the uh, sockets where the wires are running to and right to ground so you know <laughs> that's going to uh, relieve a lot of room now I noticed this transformer here let me see if I can get it this transformer here bolts in up here but only one leg is bolted the other leg is folded under now I'm hoping that with those capacitors removed I can get in here straighten this other leg out drill a new hole for it and bolt it with both legs and that'll hold it because you know it's sitting here like this it vibrates a little bit and you know we don't want to uh, break the leads off of it because that will just be more work for us to have to fix so that should be able to remedy that problem. One other thing I didn't mention earlier, uh, there's a part he is missing from this radio. And that is the shield that's supposed to go over here. So I looked at pictures online and sat down and took some measurements. And I pretty much uh, 
got it drawn out how it's supposed to be. Now I've got to uh, find some material and go ahead and cut this out and bend it so I can get this shield back on here. And I do have a piece of copper. I might just uh, use that. Um, it's a little bit easier to bend than what this uh, aluminum is. So I'm going to have to do that before we get finished up on this thing. Okay guys, uh, went out to the shop, found some copper, and uh, measured it all out and bent it, cut out the slots to clear everything, all the wires, components that come around it, and got that bolted in place. I know it's not original, but it should uh, do the job for the time being until I can locate an original shield. It's not perfect. But, you know, it serves the purpose. It's a shield. And I got it on there. So one of the latest fun tasks was to figure out what to do about this phenolic insulator. You can see this one. All four corners were ripped off of it. And they had glued it all together. And that glue just deteriorated and went everywhere. Well, I started searching around in the shop. And found some of this old uh, phenolic board I had from many years past. I mean, many years. And it's very thin. It's just a little bit thicker than the original. And uh, I cut me out a piece. And made me one. So that should work just fine. So we can get all this together. And see how that works so the old ranger one is coming along pretty nicely um, she's all cleaned up something else I have to deal with is that whoever originally removed the shield off the VFO left the mounting um, studs in the chassis you're supposed to go underneath the bottom and remove the quarter inch nuts then pull the shield where well, they left the uh, took the, uh, the bolt and the nut off here why they done it this way I have no idea maybe at the time they thought it was easier I just don't see how because this one back here at the back you can't even get to to uh, remove the uh, nut and the bolt if that's what it had now it might have been riveted I'm not sure but I got to go back and take these out and get those mounted back on the uh, VFO shield and we can worry about you know go ahead and start putting this back together I've got the uh, a new OA2 tube to go here uh, rest of the tubes checked out fine so I'll be working on that and doing some voltage tests I think I'm gonna go ahead and uh, end this video here and we'll call this part one of the uh, Ranger 1 restoration project and uh, until we get time to get back on it, we'll see you in the next video. So one of the big questions that still remains is what are these three resistors doing? Why are they in this circuit of the radio? Well, a, a guy on the AM forum, he uh, led me to some Johnson Ranger mods, and that might explain it just a little bit. We look here on the drive part. But if we go here to uh, this end of this resistor, and go to our red wire on our drive part, you can hear we have continuity there. And after looking at that modification, I think that what they've done, this is a crude method of doing it. They did not do it right, but it is to relieve stress on the drive part control. As I said, this is a 4 watt resistor, 25K. So it's already, you know, on the verge of being stressed. And they put these uh, resistors here to kind of help absorb 
some of the uh, wattage that was going to this resistor. We'll look at the uh, information on it here in just a moment. So you know we checked the VFO before we uh, button everything up and we had an output signal on the VFO that was working correctly. Although the radio was not generating any frequency. And you remember, you know, I went through and checked all the tubes, and all the tubes checked fine on the, uh, the old tube tester. Uh, this is when tube testers don't always tell you the truth. This 6CL6 right here, it checked fine on the tester. But it actually has a short in that tube, and that is preventing... Um, this first 6CL6 is part of the oscillator circuit and it is preventing any uh, frequency from passing so that has to be pulled out and we'll get a new one stuck in there. And I've got the tube pulled out and you know I didn't see this before I didn't notice it but if you look right around the uh, bottom of the plate you can see it's uh, black also up here around the uh, top edge of it all the way around it it's got kind of like a burnt area on it so you know from checking the voltage underneath I was definitely seeing a dead short with the tube removed the short's gone okay I have another 6L6 or another Look, you have another um, 6CL6 we can stick right in there and uh, should be able to continue testing. Hopefully that will eliminate this problem. But you can see the radio is pretty much back together. So, you know, we just want to go ahead and get some testing done. And uh, I've got the uh, radio loaded up on 20 meters. And uh, got the old Johnson desk mic. And take a look at the IFR here. And we'll key the radio up. Just a little bit off frequency. Turn the VFO. We're showing about, oh, I'd say about 30 watts on the meter. Test one two, test one two, and about 75 watts right there. And turn the volume up just before feedback. And uh, here's an audio. Radio check one two, one two. Y'all but a little ringing in the background from the uh, feedback. It sounds very good. Not bad at all. Which you know the IFR 1200 is not the best. Uh, sounding speaker you can get but it's it's not too bad and she's holding the uh power pretty good